All right, so thank you so much for coming to this. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this, Meet the Scholar is an initiative that STR started over the summer once we all went virtual. Um, this was Samina's idea to allow us to talk to some of the prominent scholars in our field, in the field of strategic management, um, and to get to know these scholars a little bit better. So I really enjoyed listening to these. For people I know, I think I know very well, I've learned some interesting things about them. And for people I don't know very well, I've decided that I'm gonna corner them the next time we have an in-person conference and really talk to them far more because I've also learned some interesting things about people beyond just what I read from their paper. And I think for me, that's really kind of the point of this. So, you know, you know their research, but there's also a person behind that research who's very interesting and does things that you have no idea that they do. And so um, really this is kind of a, a conversation where I'm gonna ask questions to Africa. Um, you know, we'll see how long, we'll sort of see where the conversation takes us. And then I'm gonna ask people if they have things that they're thinking about, please put it in the chat. At the end of my conversation with Africa, we'll open it up and I'll certainly start with things that are in the chat. Um, I'll also, you know, if you want to not put stuff in the chat, I'll also open it up later. If you have sort of questions that you'd like to ask Africa, um, we'll kind of proceed as, as we, we, as it works. Um, okay, but so, so thank you very much for coming. I know that there's a calendar that lists all the other Meet the Scholar events that are upcoming. Um, so I do want to thank Zhao. She's here. She's organized this particular session, and she's also um, contributing to this effort during the fall and spring semesters. And so please visit the calendar, the STR calendar, where you can see all of the other Meet the Scholars that are going to come along. And I believe we're done for the fall. I think the next ones will be in January. Um, we also, uh, Paulo has done a very good job of putting these, posted, posting these on the STR website. And so if you can't make it, you can certainly see the YouTube uh, recording of it later. So I encourage you to visit the STR website. Okay, so um, today we're talking with Africa Arino, and that's the best I can do because I don't speak Spanish. But I think, I think Perfect. It's <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm just Africa, so I can, I can just go with that. Um, Africa, so, you know, full disclosure here, Africa and I got our PhD at the same uh, institution. I did not overlap with Africa, but I, I feel like I know her, right? If you get your PhD from the same place, you just feel like you've been through a similar, you know, dire circumstance. And so you've, uh, you've got something in common with someone. So I, I feel like I have a bond with Africa, even though I did not overlap with her. Um, Africa, let's see, so advance my slide, there we go. Africa um, is currently at IESA. She is, which is in Barcelona. I had to look that up, figure that out. Um, she is currently the, now this one I'm gonna not pronounce right, the Joachim Mullins Figueras, close? Anyway, yes. Chair of Strategic Alliances. She's served in a couple of different roles at uh, IESA. And so we'll talk about a couple of these in terms of service, but she's been Deputy Dean for Faculty, Department Head, uh, Director of the PhD program. She, as I said, got her PhD uh, from UCLA in strategy and organization. Um, we have at least one person I know who was on both of our committees, Jose De La Torre. Um, Africa, who else was on your committee? Uh, it was uh, the good man who passed away, uh, Bill Ochi and Elaine Mosakowski. Okay, so Bill Ochi and Elaine were still there. They were not on my committee. Um, but we have, we have Jose in common, and Jose is a, a large figure that, uh, you know, I'm sure we both benefited from, from his advice on our dissertations. Um, let's see. So, you know, research areas, I think of Africa really as, you know, I think about trust, I think about kind of interpersonal relationships, I think about sort of strategic alliances, some really careful work, um, you know, going in depth on partnerships, on alliances, really trying to sort of understand the evolution of relationships. And so, you know, her research interests that she lists on her website include the governance and management of interorganizational relationships with particular emphasis on strategic alliance design and dynamics. Um, her research has appeared in a number of different outlets. Um, she's been the associate editor of the Academy of Management Discoveries, the Global Strategy Journal. Um, she's been associate editor at the European Management Review. She's co-authored um, at least one book, I think more, uh, also some edited versions. Um, she's a fellow of the SMS. She is, she will be starting January 1st, the 
uh, president of SMS. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, she also spent half a year visiting uh, Lagos Business School um, and Strathmore Business School in Africa. And she's got some interesting things that I did not realize she had Africa from Africa. And so we'll certainly talk to her a little bit about that as well. All right, so that's my overview. I'm gonna stop sharing. I feel like this is preparing me to teach. So I was I'm <laughs> happy with myself. I'm, I've successfully stopped sharing. Anyway, I think I've successfully stopped sharing. <laughs> um, so, so, okay. From my point of view, I've stopped sharing. Okay, so um, Africa, generally where we start with this really is asking you how it is you even came about to get a PhD. So what were you doing before your PhD and, and how is it you managed to end up at UCLA? Okay, well, uh, Heather, first let me thank um, Jiao for organizing this meeting and you for, for having uh, this conversation with me and of course participants for being here. Mm, well, I started a PhD uh, because, uh, well, a number of reasons, obviously. Mm, I come from a family uh, that is in education. Mm? So my father was a high school teacher. Uh, I come from a large family. There are six siblings, and I'm the third PhD, and one of my brothers-in-law also has a PhD. Wait, wait, your parents have three of six kids who have PhDs? Yes. Oh my god, okay. <laughs> That's impressive. Yeah. So, as you can see, it runs in the blood. So, it was very natural for me to think about pursuing an academic um, career. I, however, I had done an MBA at ESA prior to, to engaging in, in this, and as I finished the MBA, they proposed me whether I would like to um, start uh, working there as an assistant lecturer, something along those lines. And so I helped a little bit in some research projects. I assisted with some uh, small teaching. And that uh, was the, the last um, uh, point where I thought, well, if I really want to pursue an academic career, uh, I do need to do a PhD and I'd rather try to do it in the US. So that's how I landed at UCLA. Did you know you were interested in alliances and strategic alliances before you started? Well, yes. Uh, when I had to prepare my application and you know I started thinking well what should, could be uh, an interesting uh, research area at, at that time that was the late uh, 80s it was the time when Spain was about to join and uh, the then called European Community, what's now the European Union. And at that time, there was a lot of talk about how uh, international competitor, uh, competitors were going to come to Spain and how Spanish companies should get ready for that tougher competition. And uh, it started hearing uh, to talk about strategic alliances as one possibility to face uh, that competition. So. I was, to myself, I was thinking, well, it's not really hard enough to manage a company. How much harder it must be to manage uh, companies together. And this is what got me interested. And this is what I wrote in my application for the PhD. And I think I'm among the few people who end up doing what they suggested they would be doing. Yeah, no, kudos for that too. Um, and so in your dissertation, did you actually do this very careful qualitative work? Mm, it was part of my dissertation. So okay. I, it was a three chapter uh, dissertation. And, and the first, I figured, well, no matter what I end up doing, uh, given that I'm in strategy, performance is going to be always important. So I figured uh, I, I could do a paper on measures of alliance performance. 
and that ended up in GIFs. Then, um, given my interest and given the coursework that I was doing, well, I always try to relate the contents of the coursework to alliances. And if I had to write a paper, I wrote it in relation to alliances. So that kept me thinking early on about uh, the phenomenon. So I drew from uh, courses like uh, Harold Damsett's, which you may have also taken her, and that paper on uh, Alton Damsett's uh, 1972, where they talk about team production and the, the team attribution problem was important to me. Game theory um, with, uh, and I read Sharon's book on the strategy of conflict, where I started thinking about cooperation as well and, and coordination of how they differ. I took courses on organization theory, on learning, in addition, of course, to, to strategy courses. So all of this uh, made me interested in cooperation in alliances and cooperative behavior. So. The second paper was on the determinants of cooperative behavior in alliances, and that was published as a book chapter. And then the third paper was a qualitative paper, which uh, became the Organization Science 98 paper on uh, the evolution of cooperative behavior in an alliance. And this okay, is- Okay, so hold on. So wait, you also had three of your yeah. chapters published. Yes. In top yeah. two, right? That's the yeah, it's top two, um, top two, and then one, it was um, a book chapter, which was yeah. good enough for what it was. No, no, that's, that's very impressive that I have three. So let's talk a little bit. So I, I know sometimes there's students, uh, PhD students and junior faculty. Could, could you expand? Okay. But I don't do qualitative research. Um, I'm very impressed with people who do. It seems like, you know, given, if, if you want to study things like evolution, if you want to sort of study trust and personal relationships, you know, one of the best vantage points then is, is going to be actually watching how things unfold and getting archival and getting personal sort of notes from board meetings and, and actually trying to explore some of this stuff. And so I know you've done that. How difficult is that to really set up as a junior scholar? And how much do senior scholars really help play a role in, in getting you connected, if, if at all? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that doing quality, doing research is not easy, doing good research, no matter what type of research. And doing qualitative research is not easy. But I also think that good qualitative research finds it, its way in good journals. Okay. It does take uh, an associate editors and reviewers who understand what qualitative research is about and who understand that the purpose is not to generalize to the population, but to generalize to theory. And not everybody uh, sees it that way or understands it that way, but uh, who can also, throughout the review process, you can convey that message very clearly. Mm, so I think that the main difficulty in publishing this type of research is the difficulty of doing good quality, qualitative research. And well, what are the difficulties there? Mm, to start with having access to good quality uh, data. Mm, and then having a strong methods. Now, this is where the difficulty uh, may come in because most PhD programs do not have uh, any qualitative method uh, course at all. And you really need it. You really need to understand it. Um, in my case, I, I, I chose, I, I'm not very sure why, but I ended up choosing a course on qualitative methods that um, Lynn Marcus uh, was, uh, she was in the information systems department at the time I was at UCLA, and she had a course on qualitative research methods. And I took it, and I really learned a lot uh, from it. 
Then in terms of um, access to data, um, you know, it was somehow a matter of, of chance, if you will. Uh, I, Jose de la Torre, of course, I was working with him and he knew of my interest. And uh, it just happened that at, uh, at the time I was there, Steve Postrel's wife was sitting in the board of science. And uh, she, um, at some dinner with the board, Steve sat next to uh, the CEO of the joint venture that uh, is uh, the focus of, of the org 98 paper. And the, we're just talking and then Steve just mentioned, well, I have a colleague who does research on joint ventures. And this uh, CEO said, oh, I would be very interested in meeting, with, in meeting him because I have a situation and rather than calling for a consultant, I think I would benefit a lot from uh, having a scholar at looking into our situation and you know, it could be of mutual benefit. So it just came like at perfect time. And the scheduling, the timing also worked out very, very nicely because, well, between one thing and another, everything sort of <laughs> wrapped up extremely well. So that was um, great. Then another, uh, it, it stopped <laughs> when I, Stop me whenever you want, Heather. Because I no, no, I'm, I'm, fa I love this. So I, I, you hear people who, you know, from prior work experience, they have access to a company. But your story is the best one I've ever heard. Steve Postrel's wife was talking to someone, and it just happened to be the right time, and you just happened to be the perfect person for it. That, that's fantastic. <laughs> right, and then another qualitative piece, which is SMJ 2010. This um, came out, uh, well, I talked to one of my colleagues at ESA who, who is very well connected with the business community. And I told him, well, you know, if there is any chance that I can do something with you um, in, in alliances, well, let me know. So a few months down the road, he called me and said, you know, I'm an advisor to this company and they are going to negotiate a joint venture with a company in Argentina. Uh, would you like to join? Uh, and I said, sure. So I went way to Argentina and I attended the meetings and I took records of everything. And then well, uh, subsequently, um, I was given access to all of the written documentation and all of the, uh, well, the, the, the drafts of contracts, emails, and so on and so forth. And that was, great a great source of, of data. yeah no, it, it doesn't surprise me now as a that you're a faculty member and you've got a lot you know you've got a big network right louise said this it's all about networks i agree it's all about networks like now you have a network i think it's hard for students to kind of get in and show that yes they know what they're talking about and so it, it does seem like your your mentors and sort of senior faculty can be very helpful um, absolutely yeah. Sorry. Do you work with Do you work with um, junior colleagues and and do qualitative research with them? Do you bring them into projects? Yeah, and actually, sometimes <laughs> they have brought me into the project. Uh, yes. Uh, well, um, we recently have accepted a new Orcside paper uh, with. Uh, a ju very junior scholar, um, Arnie Keller, who is. Now he graduated, but he was a student of Thomas Mellevit from the Free University of Berlin. And they brought me in. They had data on, again, on all of the, the history of um, an alliance in between in the pharma, well, in the veterinary drug industry between a German and a US company. So they had this great data and we also call later on Fabrice Lumino. And we, this is a third piece, uh, important uh, qualitative research piece that I have engaged with. 
and I have worked with some uh, PhD students here at ESA and helping them also with their qualitative pieces. Yeah, that's great. No, that's, that's great. Um, so which of your publications are you most proud of and why? I think I could pick two rather than one because they have something in common. And it's the Organization Science 98 paper that I just was talking about and SMJ 2007 with Jeff Royer on uh, contracts as coordination, uh, safeguarding and coordination um, mechanisms. And the reason I, I really like these two papers is uh, that somehow I believe they have contributed um, changing uh, the conversation. It's not that they were the only ones mm, making this conversation shift, but certainly they have contributed. So for instance, the, the 98 paper, and uh, we wrote it at a time when the uh, Alliance field was uh, dominated by transaction cost economics. And at the time, uh, the focus of the study was the decision to create or not to create a joint venture. And at that time, I think it was novel to shift the focus to um, a process perspective. And I think that that is part of the contribution and the important contribution of this paper. In the 2007 paper with uh, Jeff, it came out a little bit too late. Actually, uh, there, there is a, a former, well, a reduced version of it was published in the Proceedings of the Academy of Management in 2003. But well, you know that SMJ had a period where you know things were <laughs> weren't working mm, too smoothly in terms of the review process. And I was took, part of that. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I was part of that. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Which is, it, I mean, I'm talking about close to 20 years ago. This is not the case at all <laughs> right now. But at the time, it took a year and a half to get the first set of reviewers' comments. So that delayed the process enormously. Anyway, the, this paper, which again came a little bit late, um, was among the first ones to open um, and say, you know, Contracts are not just about safeguarding. They can also serve a coordination function. So I think that these two papers have somehow contributed moving the conversation to a different area. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I like those both of those publications, so I'm glad you picked them. Um, yeah. So, and SMJ, this was before they went to management central or whatever, manuscript central. Well, I'm, right? uh, yeah, uh, yeah, before... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, just, I, I had two kids in between the time I submitted something and it, it got published at SMJ back in the early 2000s. So I, I'm with you on, sometimes it took a while. Um, yeah, all right. So um, I'm glad you picked those because I, I do think that those are important publications and I do think they've been influential. I'm gonna, I want to pivot now to talking about how, how you manage successful partnerships, if you will, with your co-authors. So in those studies partnerships, you, you must be pretty good at it. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you've got some insights that the rest of us can can learn from. But how do you how do you uh, what's your best advice for thinking about co-authored relationships? Well I think um, that it's important to work with people with whom you, you enjoy working. And that doesn't mean that there will not be conflict, but it will be healthy conflict that helps you move forward. And uh, actually it's funny because if I may parenthesis, once my mother, uh, I, I was talking to her and you know, there are six of us, as I said, and you know, there are important things where we have different views, uh, but we, 
it's fine. We, we, we live with that. We love each other madly, but we have different views. And once my mom was telling me, well, your sister, blah, blah. And I was saying, well, yes, but think that, you know, she also blah, blah. And then she told me, no wonder you study collaboration between companies because you are always trying to build bridges. So I had never thought of that. <laughs> but I thought it was funny. So yes, in, in, I also try to build uh, good collaborative relationships with, with my co-authors and again, a healthy conflict. So you have to be careful in, in managing the calendar because co-authors will always have different priorities both in terms of the physical calendar and also, you know, you work with a senior or with a junior scholar, um, the kind of things that you are um, handling on your daily life are very different. So that takes uh, some mutual adjustment. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I think that um, I have learned a lot from my co-authors and I I enjoy working with them because of that. On the one hand, of course, uh, the opportunity for intellectual exchange, which is uh, very enjoyable, but also I have learned a lot about the review process in working with my co-authors. So, for instance, I have learned from uh, the people who were more senior than, than I, I learned a lot about putting reviewers' comments into perspective mm, and giving them the right weight, mm, what you should be really worried about, things that, you know, just do whatever you can and show that you have done so. And I have also learned from um, some of my other co-authors about the thoroughness in the review process I, in addressing the, the, the points that uh, reviewers make and how to think about addressing the comments as a, as a whole and, and all of that. And also yeah. an advantage of working with people who are in different time zones is that they, they become longer. <laughs> you send something out and next, next day in the morning you have already the feedback. So that makes it very productive. Yeah, I don't always like that though. I don't always like to get it back so quickly. Like once I've sent it off to someone, I'd like the 24 hour, like just like give me a little bit of a break from it. Yeah, no, but when you are pressured by the deadline, it's good, but I agree, I agree. And this is where, you know, this mutual adjustment of priorities and timing becomes important. As you say, it doesn't have to be always like next day. But at times it's convenient. No, it is. It is. No, I agree with you 100%. I think the benefits of having some senior colleagues in particular in the review process has been, uh, I've benefited from that, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, my first papers were actually sole authored, and so I didn't have that as much. Um, and my early responses were probably not as good as my mm -hmm. responses. Um, so I think I, I completely agree with you on that. I mean, so you have some repeat relationships. Right, those are also... Can you say that again, Sam? You have, you have repeated relationships as well, yeah. right? So similar yeah. co-authors over time, mm -hmm. um, which suggests that that's a, a good relationship and you push each other and you're efficient. Mm -hmm. Have you also had some ones that weren't so great? No, I think that uh, <laughs> they have all been good. Uh, some did not end up like having... Uh, repeat um, rela relationship, but still they were good. They, they, I, I've never fought with co-authors in a way that breaks a relationship or anything, not at all. But you know, it's also the personal chemistry is important. So yeah, and that, probably making sure the chemistry is there to begin with. So you have just had this really smooth sale of like your career and the PhD, right? You just, you go in, you, this company comes to you practically, you have no bad relationships. Like, I, so for junior scholars here, this isn't always the way it works, right? People don't always give you companies that you can get qualitative research from. Yeah. Some of us do actually have relationships where that paper goes nowhere 
and you know it's that's the case as well but it, it, the relationship has been good but the paper has not gone anywhere that's the case yeah actually those are the unfortunate ones where you just sort of you, you really like the person and for some reason it just kind of doesn't come together um, yeah no you you definitely you, you've been um i don't know as, as i said the smooth pattern it, I, I, sh I would say yes, it's been smooth, but at the same time, I always tell uh, PhD students there is always an horror story to any dissertation. And of course, I have my horror story in, in my dissertation. So there are. Yeah, always no, I, I'm, I'm sure with your committee members, I'm sure they, they pushed you <laughs> in some well, Alex, yeah. yeah, some different ways. Um, all right, let's 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 switch this around a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about Africa from Africa. So first, how, what, what, what even preceded you going to Africa? And, then, and you know, I'd love to hear about the blog and, and whatever project you're still working on. Yeah, well, um, I think that was a very unusual choice for a sabbatical, for a year sabbatical. And the reason I decided to go there is that uh, like one year before that, um, I was at a meeting, well, my, my school, ISE, has a, a broad network of uh, business schools that uh, we, we have contributed creating for some that we have not been at the outset, but uh, we have helped develop them in emerging countries mostly. So uh, we were at a meeting of uh, faculty members of a strategic management departments in this, from, from this network of schools. And there um, I heard um, Tunji Abedjesan, um, uh, who, was, uh, who, who was at the Lagos Business School, talking about his country and his school. And the way he talked about it, I thought, this is it. This is where the future is. And I need to go there before everything is cooked. So I organized things at home. I organized things uh, at a school. Um, and there I, I went. I have to say that I received different reactions. Um, like some people were yes go there this is exciting and some people were like why on earth would you go there but i think that was a super enriching experience and so i spent three months in at lagos business school in nigeria and three months at strathmore business school in kenya and what i did there was main, well i went there with a very open mind and no specific research agenda, just to have conversations with business people and to start understanding uh, the business environment and management practices there. So what I did was to interview as many um, executives as I could have access to and uh, in some cases, they well, they were both um, executives of uh, local companies as well as uh, subsidiaries of uh, MNCs. Uh, and in some cases, they had international operations. Also, the, the local companies had international operations, mostly uh, in our African countries. So um, whenever that was the case, that's the thread that I took in the conversation. And this is where um, an interest in Africa from Africa, uh, which also plays around with my name, uh, came in. And so I figured, well, um, one way to boost economic um, growth and social pr progress in Africa is through the internationalization of African companies. So this is essentially what I did. I also actually, um, a, while at Strathmore in Nairobi, um, I engaged in some capacity building activities and in particular 
uh, I worked with them in designing and launching their PhD program. And over the years, I have also been uh, contributing to that. No, that's great. So do you have research that's come out of those contacts? I have an ongoing project uh, that uh, for, uh, also for some reasons that have to do with uh, personal situations of some of my co-authors. Uh, it has not get to publication stage yet, but we have um, a project on cross-border acquisitions uh, of African companies by other African companies. And so hopefully that will see the light. No, that's great. That's great. And so do you, um, do you return? Are you still involved with the PhD program there? The yes, the yes, network? yes. I, I go there to, not, not to Nigeria, I haven't come back, but to Kenya, yes, I, typically I go there at least once a year. And uh, they created in, in this program, which I call the pre-doctoral workshop, which is a one week program where uh, people who are thinking of doing a PhD get exposed to, very, to the various stages of um, the research process. And also uh, we design it in a way that allows them to start thinking about their research question. So I thought this was a very smart idea that they had, and I think it's to be reverse engineer, uh, because it, it, it not, not only it helps people understand what research is about, but also they are potential applicants to, to your program, and it gives you a great opportunity to know them way much better than just through a, a application because if you are the, with them for one week you see how their mind works so you can no, make... that sounds that sounds like something almost all of our universities could probably benefit from yeah um that's i think that's a, a great idea i wrote that down actually because i so i mean when we interview people right you you have them read an article you talk to them but it's i think you're never able to spend quite enough time with them to really kind of either get a sense of them or to know that they really understand what them, they're getting themselves into. Absolutely. That actually sounds like a, a great idea that we could take from Africa, from Africa. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you for sharing that. Um, all right, I'm going to ask a couple more questions and then I do, I think I'll open it up to see what kind of questions we have. I'm not paying attention to the chat, but I see there's some, some text going on in there. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about SMS. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for people who maybe don't know big differences across SMS and, and AOM, <laughs> how would you describe SMS and, you know, how do you, what is your role as president next year? Like, what do you, what do you see yourself doing? What do you hope to do? What do you envision? Yeah, so I think that um, while the academy it's a broad trend mm, that you know you have a strategic management division and many other divisions that are, it is great to have that broad trend because it allows you to engage in conversations with people from different fields from different areas and enrich uh, your your thinking in this way in contrast the sms is focused on strategy mm -hmm. and um, that means that um, the communities within the strategy field can be better identified in, in the SMS than in, in, in the AOM where you have the uh, strategic management division as, as one. Right? Well, there you have the SMS with the different interest groups. So I think this is one difference. Um, then also something that's very characteristic of the SMS, which is part of, of its DNA, it's uh, what we call the engagement uh, among ABCs, the academic, business people and consultant members. And actually this, uh, this is part of what uh, we have been working in the last few years 
to re-engage because over time uh, the academic community has be become more dominant and yes uh, the business people and consultants are always present but we would like to strengthen uh, broaden and strengthen uh, those relationships because it's an enriching dialogue so we have been working in that direction and I plan to keep working in that direction also as well as in the direction of um, creating uh, new ways to add value uh, to our members. The, the, also um, the SMS has from its very beginning been very international, which the Academy is as well. But this is also a, an area of, uh, for, our, for work, uh, but I think that it, it comes second to what I just said. Yeah, no, I think, um, I agree with you. I think it's, SMS used to be more engaged with the ABC part. Um, and so it does seem like there's an attempt to, to regain some of that. Um, I do think sometimes it's hard to do because um, the, uh, you know, academics are talking in a very different way than the business consultants. And so I do think there's a lot of, of benefits that can be created when you have a conversation. It's just, it, it takes some time to figure out what that conversation is and, and how to engage sort of multiple parties into that conversation. Yeah, uh, and I think it, like the, um, the main conference is mostly for academics. And I think it will stay this way, even if we have always a uh, plenary speakers who, are, who can come from the B's and C's. And also I think that the pre-conference activities engage um, many business people and consultants. But beyond um, the main conference, there are other opportunities for engagement. I would say that it's not all business people and all consultants that will be interested, but it's what I, to myself, I call the, the illustrated practitioners, those who connect with, I mean, there are some people who are very um, well read uh, of uh, our work and who really appreciate uh, our frameworks and where, you know, you can establish a very enriching dialogue. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think sometimes the feedback you can get from consultants you know, is very useful in terms of, of managerial implications, in terms of kind of positioning, in terms of thinking about things that you hadn't thought about. So, um, yeah, okay, excellent. Well, I wish you luck when you um, take that on. So Thank you. January, very soon. Um, so, all right, so I've been asked by Zhao if it's okay if we do a screenshot before I open it up to Q&A. So if people are willing to show themselves um, and smile for the camera, we'll, we'll post you, you become famous on the STR website. Um, if you think that's fame that you seek, that's fantastic. So, um, Zhao, do you do that? Because I don't know what to do if I'm doing it. Yeah, I'll do that. Excellent. Okay, great. One, two, three. <laughs> Say cheese. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. And thank you, Zhao. Okay. Um, okay, so first of all, I really enjoyed talking to Africa because I had no idea she was from a family where three of six kids all have PhDs. I do want to ask one thing though. So what are the other PhDs in? Are, are you guys in similar fields? One is in medicine and, and the other is in math, but he works at the business school in decision science. Okay. And does the doctor, the medical doctor look down on the two of you? No. <laughs> You're, you don't really have a doctorate. You can't <laughs> self doctor. No, we have that going on here in the United States with... Uh, Dr. Jill Biden, or whatever it is we're supposed to call her. Um, well, good. I'm glad that doesn't introduce strife into your, your family. I'd love to have a doctor in my family. I keep telling my kids, like, you know, please study some diseases that I might have. Uh, actually, one of my nieces is also a PhD, now that I think about it. <laughs> well, something about the family. Okay, it's in the genes. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's see. So I would, I would love to open this up to some questions. And so I see there has been some stuff going on in the chat that I've been paying no attention to really. Um, so uh, let's see, We've, we definitely have some things here on Africa. Um, 
So Louise asked earlier, um, what in your experience are some of the biggest challenges for the research environment in Kenya or Africa more generally? Well, um, data access, it's, it's complicated because um, the, there are not good databases, there are not, um, yeah, it's not that, that reliable data on Africa. Then uh, when you do interviews, um, and I have been told by, by Africans themselves, it's like, well, be careful because of social desirability bias, essentially. That there may be a lot of social desirability bias. So this is something to be taken into account when doing a qualitative research or when doing um, surveys. Yeah, so it's even more difficult to make sure. I mean, as an outsider, it's also going to be difficult to kind of get in at any setting, right? But as an outsider, to kind of understand more um, what the situation is, what the institutional infrastructure is, sort of, there's lots of things that can be influencing what you're trying to study. Absolutely, absolutely. And of course, you, I, I'm just uh, answer in relation to data access, but you need to have a an understanding of the context there, of the social institutional context, because it's very different. So, well, as every part of the world, every region is different, but so not to impose our own views. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, so then I have a question here. Um, says, do you think business scholars can strongly impact the African business evolution regarding how research is performed at the moment? Um, if not, what should academics do to make it happen? Well, I think that, the, okay, there are two issues here. On the one hand, the main uh, problem for Africa to really take off is uh, the institutional environment uh, and the level of corruption uh, among politicians. As I said that, I just have to open the window and look at my own country and region and city and oh my god! So yeah, yeah. Uh, here, here too, yeah, here too. Right, right. So, but the problem there is that it's pervasive. It runs throughout. Here, it's more localized. You know, this group of people or that group of people there. It's everywhere and that makes it complicated for companies to, to, to make progress. And then uh, the other issue is that yes, we as researchers, uh, I think we can contribute, but we have to be very careful, not, again, not to overimpose our own categories from the Western world. And that happens uh, also like with companies that go there and try to do things the way uh, they do somewhere else because that's the way things should be done and they do not take into account the local context to adapt. And by the way, this is where partnerships are very, very <laughs> useful. Uh, so th the same could happen with us academics mm, to think that uh, the way we view management um, is universal and that what we learn from a Western uh, context can be applied to other parts of the world. So we have to be careful. Yeah, no, I mean, I think what some of the stuff that you're talking about with the pre-doctoral program, sort of a, within the local institution, sounds like a, a fantastic thing to help the both that local institution, its own programs, and, you know, frankly, figure out, like, what locals are wanting. Like, I, I, I would love, to, as I said, to do that here. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, all right, Asim has asked a question. As someone who's done an incredible amount of service, both through institution and the profession, what advice would you have for junior scholars thinking about how and when to get involved in service activities? And so yeah. here, you, you've been dean of the, of the of sound like faculty, you've led the PhD program, you know, service outside of your institution. Like, how do you, how do you manage all of that? Yeah, uh, at, uh, okay, I think that service has to be incremental, little by little, so you need to adjust that 
to your career stage. And um, I think that uh, some of those jobs, uh, one in particular being associate dean for faculty, um, I was asked too early mm, to do it. Mm. So I, well, for whatever reasons, I ended up accepting it, but I think that came too early. Mm. So I, my preference would have been a few years down the, down the road. Mm. And then you need to balance things, internal service to your school and external service into the field. And in that, I, I have tried to be careful. Like for instance, um, um, I, I was um, an officer in BPS and at the same time, I was asked where I would um, run elections for the SMS board. And I said, no, I'm not gonna do that now. If in two or three years, you still think that I could be a good candidate, let me know, but not now. So when I, I became board member and uh, I, have, I was there for two terms, and then they asked me, would you run for SMS president elections? And I said, no, I need a break. Again, if later on you want to ask again, I will consider it, but not now. In the meanwhile, I became department head. Uh, so when I was again asked, uh, to go for the uh, for elections for president of the SMS, I talked to my dean, uh, my dean of faculty, and said, "Well, uh, I've been proposed this, um, but I cannot do this, and at the same time be department head." So we made an arrangement so that uh, well, there was still some overlap of one year overlap while I was president elect, but then in January last year, this year. I was released from being department head. So you really need to be careful not to overload yourself and to balance uh, over time and also balance internal and external service activities. Yeah, no, that's good that your, your university um, sort of recognizes the external service and sort of limit, or lets you sort of kind of limit the internal. That's not always the case, but you don't only hear from people who are asked entirely too early to go into very administrative roles um, and it is very difficult to say no, um, especially when you're going up for a full or going up for something where that service part matters. So I think the, the advice um, that I'm hearing that I've definitely heard from others is like try to pick what it is that you're willing and able to do at that moment yeah. and, and use that to say, no, I'm sorry, I can't do these other yeah. things. I'm doing this, but you know, let's talk again in the future yeah. whether I could do that. Um, okay, excellent. Thank you. I have... Um, Another question that I think has just come from me, but I'm going to read it. Um, so Dennis Gann, who's a PhD candidate from the University of Oslo in Norway, says uh, two questions. One, how has strategic alliance, how has this, how, how, has, how has the strategic alliance literature changed over the years? And what is the direction of strategic alliance literature moving forward? Like where do you see opportunities in this literature? Yeah, well, I think it has uh, moved from an initial focus on dyadic alliances uh, to portfolios of alliances, and now to, uh, well, I hate the word, but to ecosystem alliances and uh, platform businesses that, you know, underneath those platform businesses, there are uh, lots of interorganizational relationships that need to be managed. Um, then it has also moved from uh, a focus on transaction cost economics to a relational perspective and, and yeah, the network approach uh, to alliances. And I think that one area that is um, missing um, is uh, the role of the individual managers. Because the alliance field is at the, at the alliance, the focus is on the alliance level, but um, many of the constructs have 
uh, like well, the micro foundations are individual level uh, dynamics. So that needs to be brought into the conversation, I think. Yeah, and that's going to be hard to get at unless you're actually going in a company and right doing some of this qualitative research to see how that evolves as well. Yeah, um, hard to get at some of that stuff with survey questions. Um, much richer in terms of, of yeah studies. Um, all right, another question privately privately to me. You, you got people can send them to everyone. <laughs> Read them. Um, but this question says, uh, "What motivates you to keep researching, teaching, and doing service?" Uh, I enjoy it. I think that's that's what keep, keeps me going. It's um, and I I see um, my the, the the various dimensions of my job as complementary. So I think that my research does inform my teaching, and uh, my teach uh, oftentimes uh, because of. Mm, specific teaching demands and so on. I need to prepare for new new sessions, new classes, and that gives me uh, keeps me thinking uh, for my research. Which um, and also depending on the level of, of teaching that uh, you do, um, I I have the opportunity to discuss about alliances with many uh, of the participants. Uh, and some of them are hands-on uh, in alliances. So that also it's a great uh, feedback for my own ideas. And then in terms of service, um, it's not so much uh, related to, to this too, but uh, you know, I, I think of my work overall as a service uh, to the participants, to the academic community, more broadly to society. And I think that um, I have benefited so much from the generosity of others who have put their time into, you know, into our associations, into managing our school, our department, that I also need to give back. So that's what keeps me doing this type of job. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I think you hear that from people when they benefited so much from you know, consortia from mentors. And so, you know, now is the time in their career where they actually really feel good about giving back and helping mm -hmm. others and mentoring. So that's great to hear. Um, all right, let me see if I have any other private questions that I might have missed. Um, no, I think, okay. So, so Africa, have you taught online? Have you? Uh, yes. yes, I have. Not a lot, but I have, yeah. And that, uh, that, yeah, so that I think, you know, sort of next challenges are. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, done both fully online as well as hybrid, having some people in the classroom and some people sitting at home. So, but that's yeah. impressive. That's hard to manage. I think that's probably the, my biggest fear of trying to manage that one. Um, so, all right. Well, I, so I don't have other questions, but I'm, I'm happy to, if, if people, students, if PhD students or junior faculty have any other things that they want to stick around for, we can stop recording. Um, we can end the, the sort of official thing. And if anyone wants to ask any other questions, I'm sure Africa has a couple more minutes.